the St. John the Baptist province of the uh, Order of Friars Minor. We are delighted that they're, they have representatives here, including their provincial, uh, Mark, who is there. And if you want anybody, if you can thank anybody at the reception, stand up please, Mark. If you want to thank anybody at the reception, Earlier I was having a conversation with Margaret Carney, who I'm going to talk about just in a little bit, and Margaret said sometimes the John the Baptist province is not recognized about all of the ways they support the development of the Franciscan intellectual tradition, and they've done it in so many ways, and this is one aspect of that. And so um, we are so grateful to your brothers and your forebearers who have done this, and I hope you th take that thanks back to them. Um, what we're doing, as many of you know, is that we are in the second day of a symposium, a symposium on uh, Franciscan formation for men for the 21st century. Uh, we began yesterday afternoon about four o'clock. There are about 42 or 43 Franciscan men and women from um, six different uh, communities, not counting the various jurisdictions, um, who gathered at four yesterday. We were inspired last night by Michael Perry's wonderful um, return to the Gospel of Mark and reminding us that Francis was a person who was about living gospel and he, he turned us back in a most amazing way to think about uh, Francis and the Gospel of Mark. And, we're, and he's been with us for these days. Michael, where are you? We're so grateful. Thank you. Um, um, what some of you missed in person, but we will give you uh, in terms of text, is that we also, besides these wonderful discussions that Pat has been recording for us. We had two amazing presentations by Sister Meg Guider this morning on, um, on mission. She did a really terrific thing for us. She, she went back to the rule and she, she told us about how F Francis first said that he first had brothers, then he had mission, and the importance of fraternitas in shaping mission, and, and that uh, presentation will be available to you uh, textually, uh, digitally. Um, and then this afternoon, Dan Horan um, took us into the 23rd century, um, and um, he's in the 24th, but we were delighted that he would come back to the 23rd and helped us think about liquidity and the abyss and why postmodernity is dead, <laughs> and why, and why the church and Franciscanism has contributed actually not only to colonization and colonizing communities, but the coloniality, the uh, colonialization of minds and what it means in the 21st century for us to begin thinking about formation, lifelong formation, in which Franciscanism doesn't simply be one more form of the colonialization of minds or the colonialization of spiritualities. Um, and once we translate Dan's work into English, uh, <laughs> I kid him because I'm so jealous that he's so smart. I hold the SCOTUS chair and he actually knows about SCOTUS. Um, so we will, we will make all of those available to you. Tomorrow morning, uh, this symposium will end and it will end by the 40-some friars and our two uh, uh, luminous sisters helping us think about what the future is and where do we go and what's next and how do we take this, this post ite vos spirit and, and keep on the march about what Franciscans and pan-Franciscanism should be. Um, we're gonna ask you that if you have a sacramental that is, looks anything like this, that you put it in St. Clara mode 
She didn't want to be in a convent, but they put her in one. So, but she still spoke. So, so keep it alive, but on vibrate, um, because she communicated with Francis her whole life. This evening, we're really delighted that we have uh, John Cordovo, the former minister provincial of the Caption Order and recently retired uh, Bishop of um, Nelson, uh, British Columbia, who will speak to us. Uh, Bill Cislack, who's on the advisory board, will soon introduce him. What John is going to do a little different from last evening is that Michael gave us this wonderful lecture with incredible breadth and wonderful scriptural depth. And we thought that this evening with John's talents, we would do something a little different. And so this is more designed <coughs> as a town hall meeting. And so instead of having a lecture in which uh, Margaret Carney, Sister Margaret Carney, as you may or may not, if you don't know, then you've got to go back and read. Sister Margaret Carney uh, holds uh, the pontifical doctorate from the Antonianum. Um, she ran the, was director of the Institute uh, of Franciscan Studies at St. Bonaventure and then became their president for how many? 12 illustrious years and is now happily emeritus uh, and back with us. So Margaret is going to pair with John as John gives us some ideas and provokes some proposals and Margaret then will process with us how to respond to these. So um, with that, I'm going to invite uh, my my longtime brother, actually when I was in the novitiate in 1966, my guardian angel who taught me how to say the office was my brother Bill C. Slack. So Bill is going to introduce John Cordovo. Bill? So John Corvo was the 71st Minister General of the Order of Friars Minor Capuchin from 1994 to 2006. But what was he doing before that? He was a Capuchin from the Central America, Central America, Central Canadian province of uh, Mary, Mother of the Good Shepherd. And as a member of that province, served as minister provincial for five terms, beginning in 1971. This has to be a record. <laughs> Is it a record? <laughs> After being minister general of the order, he was ordained the sixth bishop of the Diocese of Nelson in British Columbia, Canada, where he served from 2007 to 2018. And in retirement, I should say happily, he is now ministering at St. Francis Table, which is a restaurant for the poor in Parkdale, near Toronto, and other things ordinations, masses, bookkeeping, uh, you name it. Uh, and probably historically, uh, our brother John has uh, just recently uh, requested from the Holy See permission to re-enter under poverty and obedience to the, to the province. We'll see what the Holy See does. But uh, John is hoping that Pope Francis will say yes. Our brother John was invited to the SCOTUS board to present the second keynote because of his intersection between Capuchin fraternal life and the needs of the church as bishop. As Minister General, John presided over the sixth and seventh 
plenary councils of the order. Now, if you're not a Capuchin, you may not know what these things are. These are extraordinary chapters in which there is no election, but in which, in which important issues are discussed uh, by, the, by the worldwide friars. The first of these was around the topic of poverty in the development of a fraternal economy in the order, and the second around the topic of fraternity. Both topics were extremely important for the formation of the worldwide friars, and in those conversations we really came to understand and appreciate the Franciscan intellectual tradition which came to life in those conversations. Capuchin ministry flows out of Capuchin fraternity, and ministry is a high value among friars, especially younger friars. I should say fraternity is. But what ministry? Ministry that addresses the needs of our ever-changing church. And here is where Bishop John's mitre meets Brother John's cowl. You will find John passionate, articulate, practical, challenging, and responding out of our Franciscan spiritual and theological tradition. Please welcome our brother, Bishop John. My sisters and brothers, may the Lord give you peace. The theme I've chosen to develop is this, a brotherhood of missionary disciples. Prior to St. Francis, Religious life in the church was modeled on the early Christian community described in Acts chapter 2. All who believed were together and had all things in common. Day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they partook of food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Consecrated life established on this model continues to radiate the living presence of God in our world. But Francis consciously chose another model for his brotherhood. He chose a discipleship model. He chose to model his order on the life of Jesus and his disciples. After the Lord gave me brothers, no one showed me what I had to do, but the Lord himself revealed to me that I should live after the manner of the Holy Gospel. This assumes critical importance for us today as we consider our Franciscan call to mission in the church. Why? Because Pope Francis has extended this vision of discipleship to the entire church, challenging the church to be a missionary church, a community of missionary disciples. I wish to consider the contribution which our Franciscan tradition brings to this challenge of forming a church as a community of missionary disciples. I have two main points I'd like to develop. My first one is this, that the embrace of Franciscan brotherhood is first and foremost the embrace of Jesus Christ. And then my second point will be for Francis the embrace of Jesus leads directly to brotherhood. The embrace of Franciscan brotherhood is first and foremost the embrace of Jesus Christ. From the admonitions, consider, O human being, in what great excellence the Lord God has placed you. He created and formed you to be the image of his beloved Son according to the body and his likeness according to the Spirit. Bonaventure, as always, helps us to understand the perspective of Francis. 
comment, he comments on the opening words of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word and the word was, with, was in God's presence and the word was God. Reflecting on these opening words of the Gospel of John, Bonaventure teaches that the Word is the expressed image of the Father. The total self-giving love of the Father is imaged in the Son. Then he reflects on the second passage from John. Through, through the Word, all things came to be, and apart from the Word, nothing came to be. Bonaventure states, that the Word is the exemplar, we might say the template or the model for all of creation. Furthermore, within creation, the human person is created to be an expressed image of the Word. Therefore, Bonaventure speaks of the human person as a little word of the Father. Jesus is the definitive word of the Father in the flesh. We are little words of the Father. And when our little word is spoken with clarity in and through our lives, God is made visible in the world. It's a powerful image. Well, Francis modeled this in an incredible manner. For Francis, the imitation of Jesus was doing what Jesus did. It was living as Jesus lived. It was thinking as Jesus thought. It was all of this, but incredibly more. What blows my mind is this. Francis sought to reproduce in his life the same relationship which Jesus lived with the Father. Imitation of Jesus was to enter into the same relationship with the Father that Jesus lived. It was to enter into Trinitarian relationship. Francis sought to be the little word modeled perfectly on the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. This is the significance of the third and defining moment of his conversion experience. From now on, I will say freely, our Father who art in heaven, and not my Father Pietro de Bernardone. In imitation of Jesus, Francis seeks to give himself totally in his relationship with the Father. From now on, I will say freely, our Father in heaven. Well, Jesus takes him by the hand and shows him the way. At the baptism of John, I'm very happy that uh, uh, last evening, Michael so highlighted the baptism of John in the Gospel of Mark. It's one of my favorite passages. At his baptism by John, Jesus enters the Jordan River as the carpenter from Nazareth. In the baptism event, Jesus experiences a profound conversion in which the Father touches the passionate heart of Jesus. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Jesus is moved to the depths of his being and he emerges from the Jordan no longer as the carpenter of Nazareth, but as the living gospel of God. Jesus leads Francis along the same path of conversion. A short time after the event before the Bishop of Assisi, Francis hears the voice of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew, sending his disciples two by two to preach the, the gospel of penance and peace. He's moved to the depth of his being. Just as the Father touches the passionate heart of Jesus in his baptism, Jesus, through his word, touches the passionate heart of Francis. This is what I want. For this I yearn. This is what I desire with all my heart. So he's, he's, he's touched to the core of his being by the word, uh, by, by, uh, by the word of, uh, of Jesus. In Francis, we see the true meaning of conversion, which is defined not by what we leave behind, but by what we embrace. His conversion was the embrace of Jesus Christ. The consequence of his conversion was his abandonment of his role as the playboy of Assisi. In Francis, we see that conversion is not a once for all event. His conversion continues throughout his life. 
At the end of his life, he exhorts himself and all of us, let us now begin, brothers, because until now, we have done nothing. Pope Francis reminds us that mission is at once a passion for Jesus and a passion for his people. If our Franciscan Brotherhood is to be a force of mission and evangelization in our world, each of us must continually renew our passion for Jesus and through our passion for Jesus be reignited in a passion for his people. For a passion for Jesus leads inexorably to a passion for the people that he has loved. In chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel, verses 12 to 49, Jesus shows us the way. Jesus has just spent the night in prayer with his disciples on the mountain. At daybreak, he calls the disciples to him and he appoints the 12 apostles. Then he leads the new apostles and the disciples down the slope of the mountain and he arrives at the plain where he encounters a huge multitude of people. The scene is dramatic. It's important just to visualize it. The apostles are beside him and behind him and in front of him, that mass of people. And Luke tells us, they have come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. The whole crowd was trying to touch him because power went out from him and cured all. Then Luke continues, raising his eyes to the disciples. It's interesting, every word is important in this passage. Raising his eyes to the disciples, he says, Blessed are you poor. In Luke, the Beatitudes are addressed to, primarily to the apostles and the disciples. They're addressed to them for the world. So the, the, the Beatitudes are addressed to the disciples for the world. The Beatitudes, poverty and humility, are not simply ascetical virtues meant to perfect us. They are meant to forge bonds of communion and love which will transform the world. Jesus challenges his disciples to share the saving, transforming power that they can visibly see him exercising among the people by configuring their lives to the beatitudes of the kingdom. But there's more. Again in Luke, specifically addressing himself to the disciples, he tells them a parable. Can a blind man guide a blind man? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A student is not above his teacher. Why look at the speck in your brother's eye if you miss the plank in your own? Can a blind man act as a guide for a blind man? Just as the preaching of the Beatitude takes new meaning by referring back to Jesus' relationship with the crowd, so this passage takes new meaning from the introduction of the kingdom event. He went to the mountain to pray, spending the whole night in communion with God. Only a return to the mountain, to contemplation, can open the eyes of our hearts allow our passion to be reignited for Jesus and the transforming power of his Beatitudes. Only contemplation of the face of God transforms the Beatitudes from social theory to faith practice. You have to look at Jesus, otherwise the embrace of the Beatitudes is simply social theory. The, embrace, the contemplation of the face of God transforms the Beatitudes in our lives from social theory to faith practice. We see this in the life of Francis in his embrace of evangelical poverty. Standing before the Bishop of Assisi, contemplating the face of God, Francis strips himself not only of the clothing provided by Pietro di Bernardone, but the security that his wealth promised him. And what does he do? He entrusts his security entirely to God alone. Contemplation of the face of God transforms the beatitude in the life of Francis from social theory to faith practice. A student is not above his teacher. 
it's important to ask ourselves, who is our teacher? Through whose eyes do we look upon the poor? Through whose eyes do we look upon the consumerism and the greed of our world? Is it the daily newspaper or the nightly television news? Is it a journal of sociology or even of theology? Or do we listen to the word of God in daily prayer? A student is not above his teacher. If the daily newspaper, a sociological journal, or even a theological journal is our only teacher, we are unable to lead our people beyond our teacher. The person of Jesus, the word of God, purifies us and reveals to us our true identities as little words of the Father. The word of God reveals to us the true identity of the poor and the true identity of our world. Why look at the speck in your brother's eye when you miss the plank in your own? We're painfully aware how the toleration of sexual misconduct on the part of clergy has blighted the church's proclamation of the gospel. Our newspapers make us abundantly aware of that. However, do we realize how our newspapers and televisions immunize us to the violence, the greed, and the dominating power that so oppressed the world and which has roots in every human heart? Only a return to the Jesus on the mountain, only contemplation of the holiness and compassion of God can help us to recognize the dimensions of our own immersion into the corporate sinfulness of our world and even the corporate sinfulness of our church, which, ex which impedes us in extending the healing touch of Jesus to the world. It's interesting as a, as a, as a side, side comment that the Pope has called the bishops of the United States together to reflect on this challenge of our church. And how is he starting that? They're on retreat. Cantalemes is preaching them a retreat. They begin by contemplating the face of God, for only the face of God reveals to us the reality of the corporate sinfulness that is part of our lives. Prayer and contemplation in our lives must transform us from ecclesiastical functionaries into ministers, disciples, and apostles of the mystery of God. Prayer to God as the breathing of love has its origins in a movement of the Holy Spirit through which an interior person listens to the voice of God speaking to the heart. For God first loved us. Powerful description. Prayer to God as the breathing of love begins, has its origin in a movement of the Holy Spirit through which the interior person listens to the voice of God speaking to the heart. For God first loved us. For Francis Clare and Bonaventure, contemplation is seeing with the eyes of the heart. Prayer and contemplation must constantly reignite the heart, our hearts, in our hearts, passion, the passion which Bonaventure describes so powerfully in the journey of the soul into God. If you wish to know how these things come about, ask grace, not instruction. Desire, not understanding. The groaning of prayer, not diligent reading. The spouse, not the teacher. God, not man. Darkness, not clarity. Not light, but the fire that totally inflames and carries us into God. That fire is God, and his furnace is in Jerusalem, and Christ enkindles it in the heat of his burning passion. There's a passionate life that comes about in a heart touched by the Spirit of God. This leads me to a question for our reflection. In the animation of our fraternities and in promoting our mission, do we not often presume, presume the personal commitment of each brother to Jesus Christ? We sort of leave like that, that's your personal question, right? Can it be presumed? And if it can't be presumed, what can we do to reawaken in our brothers that passion for Christ which we see in Francis? This is what I want. For this I yearn. 
This is what I desire to do with all my heart. Let us now begin, brothers, because until now we have done nothing. My first point, which is that the embrace of Franciscan brotherhood begins with the embrace of Jesus Christ. <coughs> if we are going to form a brotherhood of, uh, uh, of disciples, it begins by the embrace of Jesus Christ on the part of each one of us. My second point. For Francis, the embrace of Jesus leads directly to brotherhood. After the Lord gave me some brothers, no one showed me what I should do, but the Most High himself revealed to me that I must live after the manner of the Holy Gospel. Francis chose minority. Francis chose humility as the defining characteristic of his brotherhood. Once again, Bonaventure gives the theological foundation of this choice. He tells us, the turning of the father toward the son in total self-giving love is the father's humility. The turning of the father toward the son in total self-giving love is the father's humility. Therefore, in his praises of God, I found it marvelous. Francis addresses God and he does not use the adjective humble, he uses the noun, humility. Why? Humility is not a quality of God. Humility is the essence of God as love. Humility defines the very to be of the Father, the essence of the Father, turned, eternally turned toward the Father, or toward the Son in self-giving love. It is the option for relationship which defines humility, and it defines the humility of God. Can you understand why then Francis chooses humility as the description of his brotherhood? He never aimed low, you understand? If humility is the principal characteristic of God, it's a principal characteristic of his brotherhood. Makes every sense in the world, okay? God is a communion of Father, Son, and Spirit made one in total self-giving love. Now, from our childhood, we were accustomed to speak of one God in three persons. Trinitarian theologians tell us it is more precise and correct to speak of three persons who are one God. For when we speak of one God in three persons, it's possible to think of God as sort of the box in which these three persons run around loving one another. It's possible to think of God as a static reality. When we speak of three persons who are one God, the unity of God is ecstatic and it's dynamic and it is explosive. Bonaventure situates the mystery of the church the mystery of church communion within this dynamism of the mystery of Trinitarian relationship. He speaks of the eternal word in the bosom of the Father, the incarnate word enfleshed in Jesus Christ, and the inspired word enfleshed in the communion of the church. And just as there is only one word, there is only one communion. There are not two sets of communion. That is, one among the divine persons and one among human persons in which the human replicate or imitate the divine. No. Communion for Bonaventure is not imitation. It is participation. There is only one mystery of communion and it includes God and humanity as beloved partners in perichoresis. I, I don't know anything about Greek, but there's a, it's a Greek word. Circumincesio, which is the, the Latin, and the one that I can understand best, the dance of life. Okay, we are taken up into Trinitarian relationship, Trinitarian communion. This understanding is echoed in preface eight of Sundays in Ordinary Times. I love this preface. When your children were scattered of, uh, uh, afar by sin, through the blood of your son and the power of the spirit, you gathered them again to yourself that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity made the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit might be manifest as church. Not become church, but be manifest as church. Taken up into, in, into a Trinitarian relationship, we are manifest as church. It is in this Trinitarian understanding of communion 
that our order finds the dynamism and the meaning of the witness of fraternal life. The conventional constitutions speak of fraternity as the icon of the Trinity. That's a beautiful expression. Fraternity is the icon of the Trinity. The Capuchin constitutions speak of fraternity as a human space inhabited by the Trinity. You have to forgive me, I didn't read the OFM constitutions, but, but uh, our constitutions are, are beginning to take this Trinitarian perspective. The church born from the side of Christ as a sacrament of unity is essentially a mystery of communion whose richness and depth are reflected in fraternal living, a human space inhabited by the Trinity. Now there are three characteristics of the early Franciscan fraternity which strongly impact our mission in the church. The first one, the early Franciscan fraternity was based on the personal relationship of each brother with Jesus Christ and through Christ with each brother in his fraternity. So the fraternity was based on the personal relationship that each brother has with Jesus and through that relationship with Jesus, with each member of his community, of each of his fraternity. Fraternity is not the embrace of a structure. It is the embrace of each of the brothers. It is profoundly relational. Second point, Franciscan fraternity is to be the inspired word. It is not simply a group of brothers called to serve the church. Francis formed his brotherhood to be the church. He never aimed low. He didn't just get a bunch of, of functionaries. He called us together to be the church. The fraternal gospel life inspired by Francis is to be a whirlpool, drawing all who encounter it, all who witness it, all who experience it, into the lived experience of Trinitarian love a human space inhabited by the Trinity. And the third point that I think is important that, uh, that touches our call to mission, there, these two basic characteristics of the early Franciscan order were strongly influenced by the fact that he chose an itinerant form of life. Itineracy is very important. Itineracy in the Franciscan tradition is much more than wandering around. We've got many itinerant friars, you understand. <laughs> but that's not itineracy, you know. It is, in, in the itinerant model, fraternal life takes new forms, not only place to place, but also with each group of brothers. Our discipleship model has been institutionalized, yet the itinerant origins of our charism continue to have important implications today and must continue to infuse our fraternal vision and our fraternal service. All communal forms of life in the church are functionally relational. However, if I speak in gen general terms, the Acts model of religious life, in that model, structure gives rise to and determines and gives form to the stability of fraternal relationships, ora et labora. Or at labora sustains the relationships between the brothers. It's perfectly okay, but that's not the Franciscan model. In the discipleship model, relationships give rise to structures, and structure exists to sustain these relationships. Franciscan communion does not flow from structure, rather structure flows from communion. This is clearly expressed in the conventual constitutions again, when they speak about the conventual chapter. The constitutions say the conventual chapter is the privileged instrument of communion, which must establish a suitable schedule for communal exercises, which takes into account daily life according to the spirit of the fraternity and of each friar. So it's not something that's imposed from above, it's something that comes from, uh, from below. Fraternal relationships are the glue which hold all the structures together. Friars don't fit the structures. Structures are modeled to fit the friars and to express their unity 
and to release their creativity. That's the meaning of, uh, of, this, uh, of any structure of, uh, of our lives. Three points then that I think are important in, in, in looking at our mission. The early Franciscan fraternity is profoundly relational. Secondly, we were called to be church and not simply to serve the church. And thirdly, that friars don't fit the structures. Structures are molded to fit the friars and to release their creativity to the world. Out of that, I see four consequences. These three points give rise to four consequences that I think help to mold our mission to the, in the church. First of all, we are an order of brothers. The brotherhood we share is profoundly relational. When Francis refers to himself, he always refers to himself as I, Brother Francis. He never says I, Francis. He's always I, Brother Francis. Leo was an ordained minister. And let's get away with another thing. Francis was not a deacon. <laughs> they say that because of clericalism. He preached the gospel, or he, he read the gospel uh, in Greccio, so they say he must have been a deacon. Well, that's sheer nonsense. There's no evidence that the man ever had a bishop impose hands on his head. Do you understand? He was not a deacon. Now, Leo was an ordained minister, but he was always Brother Leo. And in both cases, it is brother with a small case B, not a capital B, because the title is relational, not occupational. Francis was enthralled by the fact that in his incarnation, Jesus became his brother. Francis then became acutely aware that just as Jesus became Francis's brother in the incarnation, he became brother to every man, woman, and child and formed a fraternal relationship with all of creation. That was the profound experience of Francis, his experience of Jesus. Brother, his, he, he came to understand who Jesus was and, and the implications of the incarnation. Francis' relationship with Jesus caused him to become brother to every man, woman, and child, and even every living creature on the earth. Now, this is not merely cute. It's revolutionary. We shouldn't treat this, oh, isn't that cute? He, 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 he preached to the birds. That, 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 that obscures the essential question. The essential question is that profound sense of how, what the incarnation meant and the new relationship it calls every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. And Francis came to that profound experience. This is fundamental to our charism. The three branches of the First Order have been united in recent times, petitioning the church to recognize the unique nature of our brotherhood and to dispense our order from the requirement that only clerics can assume ministries of leadership in our orders. This is important for the unity of our brotherhood, but it's not the most important dimension of it. Who holds office is, 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 in that sense is relatively unimportant. It's much more important. It's much import, more important as our witness to the church because in this way we can witness to the church that, in, uh, that, that a Franciscan cleric can be subject to a lay person and, 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 and lay members of the church. And this, is, this enhances our ministry and enhances our, our, our mission. Isn't that something the whole church has to learn? The church is trying to, to, to come to grips with the place of the laity within the church. Well, if they can't even recognize the place of laity within the Franciscan order, how are they going to come to recognize it in the whole church? And so it just sit shows the, that, that, that uh, without in any way denigrating the importance of the priesthood, that we, can, we have a call to give witness to something profound in the church. There's a, another dimension. There's another important ecclesial dimension of this identity as brother. A Franciscan who identifies himself as brother, as Francis identified himself as brother, will minister to his neighbor in an entirely different way. There can be no hint of domination in an authentic fraternal relationship. 
If you are my brother or if you are my sister, I, I, it's, it's, it's a much different relationship. So I cannot minister to you in a dominating and, and, uh, and, 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 and power-filled uh, power way. This is a strong witness, an anecdote to clericalism in our order and in our church. Pope Francis reminds us that priesthood has authority. However, and I quote Pope Francis, the key and axis of this authority is not power, understood as domination, but the power to administer the sacrament of the Eucharist. And allowing uh, uh, the, the equality and community uh, uh, of, of our lay and clay brothers is in no way undermining uh, the, the centrality of the, of the call of the priest and his, and his exercise of, uh, of uh, 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 his Eucharistic ministry. Franciscan fraternal relationships live joyfully should become a force to redefine priestly relationships, totally ordered to the holiness of Christ's members, quoting Pope John Paul II. Aside from how we may be addressed by our people, a friar priest, or let's, see, let's include a friar bishop, who identifies himself as brother, where well, that is his profound identity, he will exercise his ministry in a different manner. And so I think as part of the of the response to clericalism in our order. We should have a reappropriation of our identity uh, as brothers to reflect what that means. To be brothers and just simply saying, oh yeah, I like, I like going to recreation with you. That, uh, I, may, I may find you the biggest bore in the world. It doesn't really matter. But it's more important that I recognize that in Jesus Christ, a new relationship has taken place on the face of this earth. And all of us are called into a new uh, uh, fraternal relationship and a, and a profound relationship as brothers. This leads me, finishes this point, and I have a question. I quote what I have already said. A friar priest or a friar bishop who identifies his brother, himself as brother, and I would even say a lay friar who identifies himself as brother will exercise his ministry in a different manner. It's not limited to the clerics. Even a, 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 our lay brothers, our lay friars, when they identify themselves profoundly as brother, their ministry to their neighbor will be a much different ministry. It applies to all of us. Do we see this as an anecdote to clericalism in our church and in our order? And can we, find, can we provide concrete examples I think of Solanus Casey as one of them. But anyway, can you think of, 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 of examples? And secondly, can we think of how we can bring this dimension of our charism more fully alive in our provinces? My second point, Francis formed his brotherhood to be church. Franciscan fraternity is not simply a group of brothers called to serve the church. Francis formed his brotherhood to be church. Inspired by Francis, fraternal gospel life is a whirlpool gathering, drawing all who encounter it, all who witness it, into a lived experience of Trinitarian love, a human space inhabited by the Trinity. We remember the incident in the life of Francis when he invited a young brother to accompany him to preach in Assisi. They walked through town, greeted everyone whom they met, when they returned to the Portiuncula, the young brother asked when they were going to preach, and the response, obvious, is, we already have. Pope Francis reminds us, in this vein, it is not by proselytizing that the church grows, but by attraction. This assumes even more critical importance in the American church today. The credibility of the church is severely conditioned by decisions to protect the institutional structures at the price of the care of the vulnerable. And so it needs, we have to preach by example. We have to radiate the gospel by what we do more than by what we say. Because when we say it, they always have the question marks. The itinerant nature of our early brotherhood also influences this witness to, uh, to fraternal life. 
Justice for eternal life took new forms place to place and with each new group of brothers. So gospel witness also spoke to the particular challenge of each group of people whom they met. Think of the wolf of Gubbio. It was not a one-size-fits-all Christianity. Rather, it was a witness and proclamation of gospel life which was applied to each person and each community which they encountered. They brought, a, why? They had brought an encounter with Jesus Christ and they did not bring an ecclesiastical structure. There was a difference. They were very active evangelizers, but they brought encounters with Jesus Christ, not ecclesiastical structures. They were not opposed to the ecclesiastical structures, but that was not their job. Their role was to bring the lived experience of Christ. The ecclesiastical structures followed them. This leads me to a question. How can we call our local fraternities to avoid one-size-fits-all Christianity and to foster an outreach of witness and service that creates space where, in the words of Evangelium Gaudium, everyone can feel welcomed, loved, forgiven, and encouraged to live the good life of the gospel. And my third point, an order obedient to but separated from the hierarchical authority of the church. This is a little more testy. The early order was obedient to the, to the hierarchical structure of the church, but did not form part of the hierarchical structure of the church. The early Franciscan Brotherhood and its mission was carried out in, in communion with and in total obedience to the hierarchical authority of the church. When Francis had only a dozen followers, he went to Rome to ask Pope Honorius to approve their way of gospel life. Was it Honorius or, or Innocent? It was Honorius, right? Honorius. Innocent? Okay, he went to ask Innocent to approve. Yeah, he, he asked Innocent to approve their gospel form of life. However, the Brotherhood never formed part of the hierarchical structure of the church. Even when the order became institutionalized, it remained obedient to the hierarchical structures of the church, but outside of it. The friary and the friary chapel were integral to the faith life of the local communities but they did not participate in hierarchical authority. It's hard for us to see this, but if, if you've ever been in, in, especially in Italy, for at least uh, for Capuchins, especially in Italy, we had 400 friaries when I was there, 400 friaries in Italy. Each one had a friary chapel, and each one was inter uh, integral to the life of the, of the local community. But they were in parishes. They were, they, were, they, were, they were not part of the hierarchical structure. This gave the brothers a unique relationship with the faithful among whom they were recognized as brothers of the people. They were seen as different than the rest of the, uh, 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 of, uh, of, of the clerics. They, all, all of them were seen in a different way. They were embraced as brothers. I'm certain this was not unique to the Capuchin branch of our order but it was shared by all of our Franciscan family. This relationship with both the faithful and the hierarchy provided a privileged platform to announce the gospel of Christ. Speaking about the Capuchin branch, and I presume it's true about all of our branches and the Franciscan family, this changed in the mid-1800s when we became a missionary order. We became immersed in the hierarchical authority of the church taking responsibility not only for parishes, but for entire vicariates. When I was the general, we still had 20 vicariates that we were responsible for across the, across the, the world. That's now I think we're down to two. So we, at that, in this role, we appointed not only pastors, we appointed bishops. My question, does not the present crisis, and I'm not criticizing this, don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing this, I'm just saying it was a change. It was a change. And it was a change in a very small part of our history. Okay? My question is this, does not the present crisis of leadership in our church not summon us to repossess our tradition, to see how we, what steps we can take to repossess our tradition? functioning outside, but totally obedient and respectful of the hierarchical structures. 
Could we not immerse ourselves in fraternal relationships with our people and lead them to renewed trust in the authority structures of our church? We would do so without conflict of interest. Very important. Now, this won't be done overnight. We didn't become immersed in the hierarchical structures of the, uh, of the church overnight. The first parish is entrusted to the Capuchins in Italy, in, the United, in, in, in North America, were in the 1800s, mid, late 1800s. The first ones in Italy were in the post-Vatican II period. So it's a relative, in, 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 across the order, it's a relatively short span. It won't, just as it didn't enter easily and quickly, it won't leave easily and quickly. It's a matter of putting emphasis in certain points. And as I was reflecting on this, I was saying, look at our relationship. I take a, I'll take a Capuchin example because I know them best, you understand? Not because it's, it's but you, you can take your own example, you'll have yours. I take the example of St. Bonaventure's fraternity, St. Bonaventure's in, in Detroit. It is not immersed in the hier hierarchical structures at all, but it has the most profound relationship with the local church in Detroit. People come from all over the place, but if they want to get married, they want to get buried, they want to do something else, they're sent to their local parishes. We're not into that, you understand? And so we have another way of relating. And I just think that these are aspects that we should stress. These are aspects where we can, we can take, uh, we can see that we can contribute to the church by stressing this dimension of our charism. I just ask you th for this. Does not, my question then, how can we call our local fraternities to avoid one size fits all, oh wait a second, let me get my next point here. How can we consciously repossess our tradition of obedience to, but separation from the hierarchical authority of the church? Not as rejection, but as a way to serve it in another way. And do we see this as perhaps an, uh, uh, the whole change that's going about in our communities across, uh, across America today? Is this not also part of our call to repossess our charism? My fourth point, the Holy Spirit is the general minister of our order. Francis tells us that the Holy Spirit is the general minister of our order. In Trinitarian relationship, the Holy Spirit is the bond of unity between Father and Son. Cantalamessa refers to the Holy Spirit as the divine us. Beautiful expression. It is not we who enter into relationship with the Holy Trinity. It is the Holy Spirit, the general minister, who draws us into relationship, creating that human space inhabited by the Trinity. The Franciscan order is a network of provinces. Each province is a network of local fraternities. And just as the unity of the Trinity is dynamic, happening here and now, so each fraternity must be a same living dynamic reality. The unity of the fraternity is not structural, happening at the moment I'm assigned to the fraternity and accustom myself to its rhythm of life. Rather, like the Trinity, Franciscan unity must be a unity that is dynamic and ecstatic. It must generate an energy which embraces daily all the brothers, each in his uniqueness and his giftedness. This gospel energy must burst forth to embrace the world. This defines authority in our brotherhood as well. The primary purpose of a minister's authority is not to get the job done, nor is it simply to make the right decisions. Rather, the minister must draw the brothers into communion and activate the gifts of each brother for the service of the fraternity and its gospel mission in the world. That's the ideal we seek. The Holy Spirit, the general minister of our order, also calls the local fraternity to be formed like the wise maidens of Matthew chapter 25. I find that as a, a lovely parable or, or a, 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 of, of, of a local Franciscan fraternity. As missionary disciples, we seek to touch and respond to the deepest desires of each person and each society in the world around us. For this reveals the presence of God. God is present in our world. God is there before us. 
God is present in every human person is, an, is, is a little word of the Father. Our society, our society, no matter how, how, how extreme it gets, down below has something of God in it. It might be covered over by a lot of sin, but there's something of God in every human situation. Joined in local chapter, the brothers are to be constantly scanning the horizons of their society like the wise virgins, among, and, and especially scanning the people among whom they are planted, seeking signs of the emerging presence of the Lord. We are to touch God in every person we meet. This leads me then to a question. How can we as ministers move beyond being mere administrators to foster a brotherhood permanently in a state of mission? And how can the local or conventional chapter become truly the privileged instrument of communion, discerning and uniting the gifts of each brother in mission and discerning the signs of the presence of the Lord in the people we serve? Mercifully, I'm at the conclusion. I wish to close by returning to Bonaventure's vision of Trinitarian relationship. God is a communion of Father, Son, and Spirit made one in total self-giving love. The love who is God is not a self-contained love. It's not the Father loving the Son, the Son loving the Father, and the Father and Son uh, one in the Spirit, forming a self-contained spiral of eternal love. That's not the Trinity. Trinitarian love is ecstatic and dynamic. It bursts forth and gives birth to creation and gives birth to history. In a similar matter, Franciscan fraternity, icon of the Trinity, is not self-contained. It must burst forth into the world in compassionate love. This is our great contribution to the evangelization of our world. Thank you.